Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jim Burdick, and I welcome you each to this Sunday worship of Community of Christ in San Antonio, Texas. <clears throat> you may be here in person, uh, and if you are welcome, you may join us by Zoom, and if you do, welcome. Or you may even uh, view us on our YouTube channel, and when you do, you are also welcome. So we're here uh, to join in community with our church family and with open arms, we all sit as equals in the sight of God. Our presider today will be priest Kelly Patton. Our speaker will be elder Kathleen Cole, who will be joining us remotely. And I will be bringing the morning prayer today. Uh, we have some announcements we'd like to share. Um, this year's Joseph Smith III Peace Lecture, which is sponsored by the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation, uh, will happen today, uh, September the 17th, today at 2 p.m. Central Time. If you uh, would be interested in that, uh, please let me know and I'll send you the link. Or if you've got a pencil and paper, uh, I'll read the numbers out and you can write them down. Uh, but the Zoom link is 818-5387-4787. And uh, there's no password and you don't have to register. Do we have any behavioral Zoom or <laughs> behavioral bingo? Uh, winners this week? Well, one, uh, yeah, uh, he's an anonymous guy. He wants to keep his name private. <clears throat> but uh, if you are, uh, these are, there are playing cards that have to do with our behavior, things we can do, or things we can recognize other people doing for us. There's uh, a what we do or a uh, what we receive aspect to it. And you can get the playing cards either online at the uh, congregation website or uh, at the table near the back of the sanctuary. Uh, and of course, it's based on our enduring principles. So it's a, it's a really cool thing to do. Crafty Ladies is not this week coming up, but will happen again, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on September 26th at 10 a.m. And I'm waiting for Marilyn to nod. Yes, okay, Marilyn nodded. So if I got the date wrong, she said it's okay to be wrong. Uh, just let you know that. <laughs> uh, they meet at 10 o'clock here in the, what was the adult class, the first classroom on the right the blue room uh, and our classrooms are colored. Each one's different. There's the blue room, the green room, there's mustard and ketchup. And so those, those are the colors going down there. So our next potluck will be after the service on September the, uh, on October the 8th, please plan to attend. Our next family games, Day will be from two o'clock to four o'clock, uh, October the 21st. And men's retreat, plan now, men's retreat will be December the 1st through the 3rd. So start marking that out on your calendar. It will be at Cianito and uh, it will be the three day Friday, Saturday, Sunday of December 1, 2, and 3. So please plan to attend. Our Sunday school classes don't happen on Sundays, uh, and they don't happen in the mornings. Their evening classes, our adult scriptures class meets, and they all meet on Zoom, and the link is the same link you would use to come here. Uh, that link is at seaofchristsa.org, and you can uh, join meeting with that. Our, our scriptures class is Monday, at 7 p.m. Our theology class, uh, both of those are adult classes. Our theology class 
uh, is Tuesday at 6.30, and our senior high class is at 7 p.m., uh, and it's actually junior high and senior high class is Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. I want to thank you again for joining us today. And as we prepare to move into our service, I, I would like to invite your uh, attention for uh, a prayer for those that uh, we are concerned with for their health and for the joy of the morning. Please bow with me. Kind creator, we come to you to uh, join in worship. And before the worship uh, begins, we wish to bring concerns that are in our hearts and lay them uh, in your uh, presence and in your hands so that uh, they can be eased off of our minds and also so that there can be healing and joy and uh, fullness brought back to uh, our brothers and sisters for whom we're concerned. Uh, we ask for healing of Kim J uh, for her foot uh, and healing for Kenneth H for kidney disease. Uh, the family and friends of Joe R uh, seek your comfort uh, in light of his passing. Yolanda A uh, needs healing from a recent illness. And Michelle has ongoing cancer treatments. Please be with her, attend her. Lila and Bruce G are recovering from COVID and please comfort them. We ask that you would be with uh, those that we are concerned with that we might not have known their names to write them down. We thank you for everything you've done for us. And these things we pray in Jesus name, amen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here in the sanctuary, those of you who aren't joining us on Zoom, and those, of course, that might watch us later on our YouTube channel. Like Jim mentioned, we are the Shenandoah branch of the Community of Christ Church. This is our 11 o'clock worship, worship service here in San Antonio, Texas. This morning, our theme is We Belong to God, and this is also Heritage Day. I am Kelly Patton, your presider. Ralph or Misty greeted you at the door this morning. Patty Walker is going to help us with the prayer for peace. Sherry, Richard, and myself will be sharing in our focus moment. Jim will help with the disciples' generous response. And of course, Kathleen's going to bring us our morning message remotely. I'd like to call you to worship with Psalms 114 verses one through eight, and this is from the Message Bible. After Israel left Egypt, the clan of Jacob left those barbarians behind. Judah became holy land for him. Israel, the place of holy rule. Sea took one look and ran the other way. River Jordan turned around and ran off. The mountains turned playful and skipped like rams. The hills frolicked like spring lambs. What's wrong with you, see, that you ran away? And you, River Jordan, that you turned and ran off? And mountains, why did you skip like rams? And you, hills, frolic like spring lambs? Tremble, earth. You're in the Lord's presence. In the presence of Jacob's God, he turned the rock into a pool of cool water. 
turned flint into a fresh spring. Let us stand this morning for our opening hymn. It's a heritage hymn. Onward to Zion, Community of Christ Sings 390, followed by our invocation. us this hour as we have gathered together to open our hearts and minds to your teachings that we do belong to you in your son's most holy name we pray amen would you please pray with me creator we pause to come into your presence we know you are already here, but we are the ones who must clear away our clutter before we can experience that presence. We speak of peace, but somehow we do not fully understand, perhaps because we cannot define it and fail to incorporate it into our actions or our very beings. Yet when we draw into your presence, we feel the peace we crave to wrap around ourselves and those we love. Perhaps gratitude for those moments keeps us from wondering how they happen. Perhaps we try to create those moments for others. Perhaps we don't remember that we have to let go so much to be in your presence. We have pushed you away by rushing into our own understanding of peace. So today we pause to pray for peace. We need your grace to understand it and incorporate it into our beings, lives, and experiences. Thank you for your presence. Amen. And now, please remain seated as we sing our hymn of journey, hymn number 242, When We Are Living.
for our focus moment, uh, Sherry, Richard, and myself will share our thoughts on the uh, about being part of the community of Christ Church. Think about your own answers to these questions. What is the most important to you about the community of Christ? And what experiences have you had that helped you know you belong to God? Community of Christ, what does it mean to me? It means family. And just like in our earthly families, sometimes we don't get along. Sometimes we don't see eye to eye. But we are still family. Going throughout on trips, I would visit different congregations sometimes. And whenever I walked into a community of Christ, I always felt like I was home. Even if some of them weren't quite the same as what I was used to, it was still a part of my extended family. God revealed himself to me and told me that I belonged to him one evening when I was suicidal. I wanted to give up because of the pain in my body. My health was deteriorating. I had been into the hospital. And I cried out to him, why can't I just go home? Haven't I done enough? I just want to die. And he told me, Sherry, you already did die. When you went down into the waters of baptism, you died to this life and when you came up out of the waters I was born within you and I remembered I remembered the visions that I had had of him pulling me out of the pit and saying go and live for me that night he also told me he loved me Thank you, Sherry, for sharing with us. For me, the most important thing about our church is continuing revelation. The fact that our church is open to change and to keep up and learn and grow. It's a continuing process. We're not stuck in a rut. Also, I know that I belong to God because I've made many mistakes throughout my life and God still accepts me for who I am. So I didn't have the opportunity of being converted to the community of Christ, um, but I'm so thankful for the testimonies of those who were converted to the community of Christ because that has enriched my life and given me a, a lot of strength. Uh, I was born into the community of Christ. And so I inherited um, a lot of what my life has unfolded into within this church. Um, but with that said, it doesn't mean that I haven't had conversion moments in which I have doubted or tested or challenged things um, and have had new discoveries uh, as a result. And uh, there was one time that I was I was reading the history of the church and I learned something that kind of just made sense to me, um, but I never really understood it that way before, which was that uh, Joseph Smith III at one time was asked uh, to uh, articulate a belief on behalf of the church. And he said, no, each individual comes to the realization of their beliefs through their journey with their uh, heavenly parent. And I love that about our church. I think that's a real gem within our church is that we are allowed to discover our beliefs, to challenge our beliefs, to have beliefs that might be different than the person sitting next to us in the pew. Um, but that is okay. And in fact, that is um, uh, embraced. And so I've loved that about our church that allows us to be a welcoming church. It allows us to be a progressive church. It allows us to be 
as uh, Kelly was describing, a church that evolves and learns and grows and matures and uh, starts in one place and, and continues a journey into another place. Um, so I'd like to share just a brief uh, testimony of mine, which uh, was in, with, with my experience, which um, uh, encouraged or um, solidified that I belong to God, which was the night of my um, evangelist blessing. Uh, I was praying in preparation for that blessing uh, back in a bedroom by myself. And all of a sudden I had this flash of a series of individuals coming across my mind. And as soon as one came in, the next, it, they disappeared and another name came in and another name came in, another name came in. And I didn't understand what was going on. But then when it was all done, I realized that these are the people who brought me to this moment in which I was preparing to go and uh, have my evangelist blessing blessing given to me. These are the people who had written on my life. Um, and I had a, had a moment of, of uh, I was kind of despondent. I, I um, felt bad because I some of them were no longer around me. I was a long ways away from them. Some of them had passed on and I couldn't go and thank them. I couldn't return uh, what they had done for me in my life. Uh, but that's who all these individuals were, people who had written on my life. And so I felt bad for that moment. And then the testimony continued and the message was written on me clearly. Um, it's not about returning the favor to those who have written on your life. It's about making sure you learn from that and write on others just as they wrote on yours. And so um, the key thing on that is in none of those flashes was I told what they believed. That wasn't what mattered. What mattered was that they loved their fellow human beings and they wrote on their life. And that was being a part of God. And that was belonging to God. And my responsibility was to carry that forward. And so um, that is what I think of when I think of what does community of Christ mean to me and what does belonging to God mean uh, it, it's not about the individual beliefs. It's about who individuals are and how we help and sustain each other. There are many types of gifts and giving and sometimes the gifts are something that we track and measure through accountants and banks. But sometimes our gifts are something that we measure through historians and souls. History tells us that during the 1850s, there was a young man in a small town in Illinois, a very young lawyer, and he ran for and won the position of Township Justice of the Peace. During his tenure, there were many immigrants moving into the area, mostly German immigrants, and locals were not very receptive. Um, they weren't very kind towards these immigrants. The young man believed that they should, the immigrants should receive fairness and equity from the justice system, despite their status. He lowered his prices and sometimes served for free and always tried to mediate fairly for both sides. Joseph Smith III was that young lawyer and he built community through his compassion and fairness and developed solidarity with the poor, the marginalized and the oppressed. Because of his ties to the immigrants, many, opposed him for re-election, and yet he won re-election, and Joseph Smith III became a blessing to his community, which also blessed him in return. Another history story, during that same general period, a Native American named Jerusha Parker married into a family in the Midwest and she joined her white husband in his church and in his church work. Their lives were disrupted by the day when the president of their church was killed and many factions soon developed. 
they went with the largest faction, which struck out on a journey that would be 1,300 miles, but they left that movement partway along and diverted to Texas. Their oldest daughter, Rebecca, continued westward. As a widow, Rebecca married a man who had a skill as a merchant, and the LDS Church appointed them to open trading posts on their eastward creeping frontier. They had a daughter named Katie Bell, and Katie, as they moved further eastward with the LDS trading posts uh, and Katie's parents, escaped the LDS hold and established a home in the Midwest and reaffiliated with the RLDS movement. Katie Bell married a man named Magoon, an immigrant from Ireland, and they eventually continued in the Midwest, having a daughter named Zella. Zella married a railroad telegrapher, and uh, just before the terrible uh, pestilences of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, Zella Magoon uh, married a man named Klein. They moved as often as they could find a new railroad job before, uh, after being laid off of the previous railroad job. They had 11 children, and most of the time, no steady job and no home. Their daughter, Dorothy, went to 11 different schools in the third grade because they moved so often due to his job. Dorothy Klein married Albert Burdick. She's my mother. I was raised with the expectation and knowledge that the mission of the Community of Christ Church was to be my destiny and my mission. A Native American woman passed her beliefs from daughter to daughter to daughter until they arrived in my, those gifts arrived in my psyche and soul. Gifts are tangible gifts or intangible gifts. They simply are. Yours are tangible and intangible. The generosity of saints has always been part of our history. You may or may not feel that you have anything to share in the work of the Lord, but the simple fact is you do. In a moment, we will share offering plates that, uh, ex that accept more tangible gifts, but you can continue to dedicate your intangible gifts to and pass them to other people near you or coming after you. You can also share gifts by sending checks to Kathleen Cole at the address given in the announcement slides, or you may share by using e-tithing at locations shown in the congregation or the World Church websites. But you can share gifts by teaching young ones and others about why you are committed to the work of Jesus and the work of bringing about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Please follow your heart today. Thank you. Uh, will the ushers please come forward to receive the gifts of our hearts? And while the ushers come forward, if you could get your hymnal and mark him 616, Brothers and sisters of mine, after I say a prayer for the gifts, um, after I say a prayer for the gifts, we'll sing the song as our gifts are received. Please pray with me. Generous creator, you have gifted each of us with family, friends, or situations that have alerted us to the call to follow your son, Jesus. We may not under understand how these promptings have moved us. We may not even understand why. And sometimes we've even resisted these promptings. 
yet here we are. We are safe in the palm of your loving hand. God, we give now what we can, and we want to be part of your motion and energy. Let us carry your story to others. Let us share the depth of your love for us with others we encounter. Thank you and bless those that give, those that serve, and those that set examples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. This is the Living Bible Translation. Give a warm welcome to any brother who wants to join you, even though his faith is weak. Don't criticize him for having different ideas from yours about what is right and wrong. For instance, don't argue with him about whether or not to eat the meat that has been offered to idols. You may believe there is no harm in this. They think it is wrong and will go without any meat at all and eat vegetables rather than eat that kind of meat. Those who think it is all right to eat such meat must not look down on those who won't. And if you are one of those who won't, don't fault those that who do. For God has accepted them to be his children. They are God's servants, not yours. They are responsible to him, not to you. Let him tell them where they are right or wrong. And God is able to make them do as they should. Some think that, <clears throat> excuse me, some think that Christians should observe the Jewish holidays as special days to worship God. But others say it's wrong and foolish to go to all that trouble. For every day alike belongs to God. One questions of this kind, everyone must decide for himself. If you should have special days for worshiping the Lord, you are trying to honor him. 
you are doing a good thing. So is the person who eats the meat that has been offered to idols, he is thankful to the Lord for it. He is doing right. And the person who won't touch such meat, he too is anxious to please the Lord and is thankful. We are not on our we are not our own bosses to live or die as we observe might choose. Living or dying, we follow the Lord. Either way, we are his. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, so that he can be our Lord, but while we while we live and when we die. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, so that he can be our Lord, both while we live and when we die. Sorry, that sounded much better. The first time, I'm not sure what I missed. We have no doubt, no right to criticize our brother or look down on him. Remember, each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, say the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Yes, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Let us remain seated as we sing. In the crossroads of this moment, Community of Christ sings 170, followed by our morning message. everyone. I am happy to be joining with you today uh, on Zoom. Um, I'm fine. I'm just being a little cautious. I, uh, I may have some 
uh, germs floating around that I really don't want to share. So, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm so happy that we have this gift uh, of Zoom that we can still join together from many different places, and yet we are still one family and one church family, one congregation. So wherever you're joining from, I'm glad that you're here with us. Um, I'm going to go back very briefly um, to our scripture reading from um, Romans. And this was, again, from chapter 14. And this scripture reading shows us, man, it is just so darn hard for us to get along. And, and you know why? Uh, because we're really good at judging each other and then arguing with each other about who is right and who is wrong. So um, there's three sections to this scripture passage. So um, I'm going to read them. But at the end of each section, I'm going to pause and give you my Cliff Notes version of what we just heard. All right. So here's the first section. I'm reading the same um, version that Kelly just shared with us a minute ago. All right. Give a warm welcome to any brother who wants to join you, even though his faith is weak. Don't criticize him for having different ideas from yours about what is right and wrong. For instance, don't argue with him about whether or not to eat meat that has been offered to idols. You may believe there is no harm in this. They think it is wrong and will go without any meat at all and eat vegetables rather than eat that kind of meat. Those who think it's all right to eat such meat must not look down on those who won't. And if you are one of those who won't, don't find fault with those who do. For God has accepted them to be his children. They are God's servants, not yours. They are responsible to him, not to you. Let them, pardon me, let him tell them whether they are right or wrong. And God is able to make them do as they should. Okay, cliff notes. This first section is about uh, what kind of meat is or is not okay to eat. And it ends with a reminder that those who disagree with you, they belong to God. Don't judge. Some think that Christians should observe the Jewish holidays as special days of worship, of special days to worship God. But others say it is wrong and foolish to go to all that trouble, for every day alike belongs to God. On questions of this kind, everyone must decide for himself. If you have special days for worshiping the Lord, you are trying to honor him. You are doing a good thing. So is the person who eats meat that has been offered to idols. He is thankful to the Lord for it. He is doing right. And the person who won't touch such meat, he too is anxious to please the Lord and is thankful. We are not our own bosses to live or die as we ourselves might choose. Living or dying, we follow the Lord. Either way, we are his. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose so that he can be our Lord, both while we live and while we die. Okay, Cliff Notes, second section. This talks about whether or not certain days are holy and should therefore be observed. And it ends with a reminder that all of us, we belong to God. Don't judge. You have no right to criticize your brother or look down on him. Remember, each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. Yes, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Cliff notes, in case you weren't listening uh, the first two times, here's a final reminder. It's not our job to judge each other. And here's a reference from Isaiah to remind you that it's been that way for a long time. This immediately made me think of the story of the six blind man and the elephant that I know I have shared with you several times. 
So in case you missed it or you weren't paying attention the first two times I shared it, here's my cliff notes. <laughs> um, there were six blind men who were arguing about what an elephant is. One said, it's big and round like a tree trunk. Uh, that was a leg. Another said it was long and thin like a snake. And that was the tail. One said it was flat and wide like a fan. And that was an ear and so on and so on. They started arguing and shouting at each other. I'm right and you're wrong. No, I'm right and you're wrong. And after lots of arguing and making so much noise that they woke up the Raja or the king, the king wisely tells them that each of them is partially right, but none of them fully understands what an elephant is because of their limited experience. None of them are fully wrong, but none of them are fully right. They need to listen to each other and work together to find the whole truth. So all that judging and arguing and yelling with limited information. Does any of that sound familiar? We have a lot of that right now, don't we? Um, I'm going to start out kind of a little dark today, but please hang in there with me, okay? Um, we will return to the light, I promise. So uh, the dark is uh, this week, I read an article in the Atlantic by David Brooks and it was titled, How America Got Mean. And this is how it begins. Over the past eight years, I've been obsessed with two questions. The first is, why have Americans become so sad? The rising rates of depression have been well publicized, as have the rising deaths of despair from drugs, alcohol, and suicide. But other statistics are similarly, similarly troubling. The percentage of people who say they don't have close friends has quadrupled since 1990. The share of Americans 25 to 54 who weren't married or living with a romantic partner went up to 38% in 2019. That's up from 29% in 1990. This is a real half, sorry, I'm not correct. More than half of all Americans say that no one knows them well. The percentage of high school students who report persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness shot up from 26% in 2009 to 44% in 2021. My second related question, remember the first was, why have Americans become so sad? The second question is, why have Americans become so mean? I was recently talking with a restaurant owner who said that he has to eject a customer from his restaurant for rude or cruel behavior once a week, something that never used to happen. A head nurse at a hospital told me that many of her staff are leaving the profession because patients have become so abusive. At the far extreme of meanness, Hate crimes rose in 2020 to their highest level in 12 years. Murder rates have been surging, at least until recently. Same with gun sales. Social trust is plummeting. In 2000, in the year 2000, two thirds of American households gave to charity. 18 years later in 2018, fewer than half did. The words that define our age, reek of menace, conspiracy, polarization, mass shootings, trauma, safe spaces. We are enmeshed in some sort of emotional, relational, and spiritual crisis 
and it undergirds our political dysfunction and the general crisis of our democracy. What is going on? Well, it's a very long article, and so I'm going to offer a few cliff notes from a few sections. Um, the first is 100 and 200 years ago, selfishness and self-aggrandizing behavior were very much frowned upon and considered character flaws. Being a good neighbor, being a good friend, having integrity and trustworthiness were valued beyond levels of education or socioeconomic status. Life was all about being a good member of the community. And then shortly after the end of World War II, things slowly started to change. Being a financially successful individual slowly became more and more important while possession of a good moral compass became less and less important, even a cause for mockery. For decades, researchers have asked incoming college students about their goals in life. In 1967, about 85% said that they were strongly motivated to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. By the year 2000, only 42% said that. So in 1967, 85%. In 2000, only 42%. Being financially well off became the leading goal. By 2015, 82% of those incoming college students said uh, building wealth was their number one aim. All of a sudden, after World War II, we were the savior of the world. And we kind of started to believe our own press, I think. Individualism was on the rise. It was more important to win than to be a good team player. I remember seeing the film Wall Street when I was a senior in high school. Gordon Gecko finally said the quiet part out loud. Greed is good. That character in that movie was written as the villain, but unfortunately, our society declared him the successful one. In a more recent film, I just saw this last week uh, from 2015, The Big Short tells the story of the run-up to the Great Recession of 2008. In one scene, there were a couple of investors researching the housing market a couple of years before the crash. And they were talking with a couple of mortgage brokers. Those brokers were describing how they earned huge bonuses when they wrote subprime adjustable rate, loan, adjustable rate loans targeting people who didn't understand what they were signing. First time home buyers, immigrants. Shocked by what he was hearing, one investor said in an aside to one of his co-workers, why are these brokers confessing? The other one said, they're not confessing, they're bragging. They were proud of committing thinly veiled fraud and taking advantage of those hardworking fellow Americans for their own gain. This greed, self-promotion, and individualism on steroids, it leads to detachment and extreme loneliness. The kind of numbers that I was talking about at the beginning of that article, more than half of Americans say that nobody knows them well. That's lonely. Again, from David Brooks' article, Lonely eras are not just sad eras, they're violent ones. In the 19th century of America, when a lot of lonely young men were crossing the Western frontier, one of the things they tended to do 
will shoot one another. As the saying goes, pain that is not transformed gets transmitted. People grow more callous, defensive, distrustful, and hostile. The pandemic made it worse. But antisocial behavior is still high, even though the lockdowns are over. And now we are caught in a cycle. Ill treatment leading to humiliation and humiliation leading to more meanness. Social life becomes more barbaric, online and off. I told you I was gonna get dark, but here comes a little bit of light toward the end of that article. And then I'm gonna start building on this light. Even in dark times, sparks of renewal appear. In 2018, a documentary about Mr. Rogers called Won't You Be My Neighbor was released. The film showed Fred Rogers in all his simple goodness, his small acts of generosity, his displays of vulnerability, his respect, even reverence for each child he encountered. People cried openly while watching it in theaters. In an age of conflict and threat, the sight of radical goodness was so moving. In the summer of 2020, the series Ted Lasso premiered. When Lasso describes his goals as a soccer coach, he could mention the championships he hopes to win or some other conventional metric of success, but he says, quote, for me, success is not about the wins and losses. It's about helping these young fellas be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. Radical goodness. So what's happening here? It's not judging. It's not debating or arguing or yelling. It's connection. It's community. It's love. It's right back to last week. What are the two rules? Remember, Richard was telling us, don't be an idiot and avoid the idiots. No, no. Do what I tell you to do the first time I tell you to do it. No. Love your God and love your neighbor. It's not complicated. It's just two rules. Okay, it's time for a multiple choice answer pop quiz. I'm going to use a familiar line from a familiar hymn in our faith tradition. And they'll know we are Christians by our A, jewelry, B, t-shirts, C, bumper stickers. Okay, none of these are great answers. They're not wrong, but they aren't fully right. Let's add another choice. D, none of the above. Well, that's probably the most accurate of the available choices, to be honest, but it still doesn't quite capture the scope of the thing. Here's one more choice. Aha, love. There we go. They'll know we are Christians by our love. A is the leg. B is the tail. C is the ear. D, none of the above. That's the Raja saying, mm, you're not quite getting it. But E is the whole elephant. Look, I didn't even plan it. E is for elephant. <laughs> <laughs> love is always the right answer it's not complicated just ask yourself do my words and actions pass the test on both rules love god and love my neighbor i don't have the right to tell someone your beliefs are wrong you're worshiping wrong. You're doing it wrong. You don't understand. You know what? 
if it passes both tests, then it's fine. My job is not to judge. It is to love. Maybe they don't want to eat that meat and I'm okay with eating the meat. Maybe they want to celebrate that holiday and I'm just not feeling it. Don't judge, love. Here's something I just shared a couple of weeks ago on Communion Sunday. Others may have different or added understandings within their faith traditions. We invite all who participate in the Lord's Supper to do so in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. You are invited. You are worthy. You are welcome. You are seen. You are not alone. You are loved. It's not complicated. Now, I didn't say it's not hard. There's a difference. Remember the story that Richard told us about the mother whose son was killed and she went to the prison where her son's murderer was serving his sentence? What did she do? She loved. He thought that he knew what love was, but she shared with him an additional understanding, not by judging, not by telling him that he had been doing wrong, just by loving. The judgy parts of our brains that are really hard to turn off, they say, excuse me, what? You want me to love who? It's not complicated, but it can be very hard. That person that I'm judging because of what they did or what they said, if their whole life is an elephant, I am probably seeing one hair on the end of the tail. I am a blind man looking at an elephant and saying, oh, I know what's going on here. That's wrong. They said the wrong thing. They did the wrong thing. There was a much better way of doing that. That's not my job. I am called to love. Pundits have been asking for a while now, trying to figure out why church attendance has been plummeting for decades. I have my own theory, so I'm going to share it. It's not complicated. People at church are feeling judged and they're not feeling loved. Okay, we're gonna take one more step down this path. It keeps getting lighter and lighter. I'm going to use another line from another favorite hymn, Weave. Now the Christ in me greets the Christ in thee in one great family. It's a whole lot easier to love each other if we remember there is a spark, a piece of the divine in each one of us. There is a part of the divine in me. There is a part of the divine in you. So if I belong to God, I belong to you. If you belong to God, you belong to me in one great family, community. It's what we do. It's literally in our name. We have the answer that people are looking for. We have connectedness. We have love. We have the cure for that loneliness. We just have to make ourselves vulnerable enough to show it and to share it. Sherry, Kelly, and Richard made themselves vulnerable today. It's not enough just to tell folks Jesus loves you. That's about the most isolating thing someone can tell you when you're lonely. You know what Jesus loves you sounds like to someone who's lonely? Jesus loves you, so I'm off the hook. I don't have to spend time with you. Don't tell them Jesus loves you. Show them 
by loving them. It's not complicated. If I can admit that I am a blind man looking at an elephant and remember that you are a blind man looking at an elephant. If I can remember that I have a spark of the divine in me and you have a spark of the divine in you, then I can love you and you can love me, even if we can't agree on anything else. People are drawn to those who exude kindness and love. Think of Mr. Rogers, his small acts of generosity, his displays of vulnerability, his respect, his reverence for each child. I want you to think about people in your place of work or at school or wherever you encounter others. If you have a question and you have two people that you could go to for the answer, which of these two people would you choose? The one who definitely knows the right answer immediately, but makes you feel kind of dumb for not knowing the answer yourself. Or the person who may not immediately have the right answer, but will not judge you and will partner with you in, an, in order to find that answer together. Who do you choose? Who are you drawn to? I'm going to pick Mr. Rogers every time not the lady who wants to make sure that I know how smart she is. Even though I am reminding myself that I'm called to love, not to judge. I am a blind man looking at a hair on an elephant's tail. It's not complicated, but it can be hard. I wanna close with these words from uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 163, verse 3c. There are subtle yet powerful influences in the world, some even claiming to represent Christ, that seek to divide people and nations to accomplish their destructive aims. That which seeks to harden one human heart against another by constructing walls of fear and prejudice is not of God. Be especially er alert to these influences, lest they divide you or divert you from the mission to which you are called. And what is that mission? Jesus had a conversation with Peter over 2,000 years ago and gave the great commission. Peter, do you love me? love God, then feed my sheep, love your neighbor. It's not complicated. For in their welfare lies your welfare. We are all blind men looking at an elephant. I belong to you. You belong to me. And we belong to God. Thank you, Kathleen. For our closing hymn, let us stand and join together in the spirit of God like a fire is burning. Community of Christ sings 384, followed by the benediction and sending forth.
Heavenly Parent, thank you for your presence here today. Please go with each of us as we go out and share with all we meet this week. The love that we can share with them is the love that we get from you. Amen. Our sending forth comes from Doctrine and Covenants 163.10 A and B. Collectively and individually, we are loved with an everlasting love that delights in each faith-filled step taken. God yearns to draw us close so that wounds can be healed, emptiness filled, and hope strengthened. Do not turn away from pride, fear, or guilt from the one who seeks only the best for you and your loved ones. Come before your eternal creator with open minds and hearts and discover the blessings of the gospel anew. Be vulnerable to divine grace. Please go and share the love and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you to everyone who helped with today's service. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our technical team for getting everything together. Go in peace. Hey, everybody. Hi, Patty. <clears throat> oh, Mom, you sound bad again this morning. Well, I haven't been talking much. That was okay. a that was a wonderful sermon, Kathleen. Four thumbs up. Absolutely. Yes. Five, Agreed. five oh. thumbs up. Ten thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> it was Hi, so Cindy. good, Kathleen. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Cindy. Hi. It was so good. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good to see you. You too. How's Jim, Patty? Patty? Well, it was a tough week, but I almost think he's a little bit better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, on the, I'm a lot better than I was. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. I sound worse than I feel. <laughs> Ly Lila, what did you have? COVID. Oh, shoot. She finally, <laughs> she, she and dad have finally joined the COVID club. <laughs> this is First the first time. Oh, wow. <laughs> I I tested positive Tuesday night and Bruce tested positive yesterday, was it? Yeah, yesterday morning. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm near the end, hopefully, and he's just beginning. And he's he's worse today than he was yesterday. His voice is mm -hmm. gone today, and yesterday his voice was still normal. Oh, my, really? Okay, yeah. My voice sound I think sounds more normal today than it has all week. Is that true, Kathleen? Not at the moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never I mind. Mean, sorry, it still sounds pretty low today. But I'll bet the more you talk, it's gonna. But if it feels better, if it feels better, that's what's important. It, yeah, it it's it feels 
it's easier to talk. I, I can say that. It's yeah. It's not, it doesn't take as much effort to get it out. Mm. <laughs> oh all. goodness. Hey Jim. Hey Carol. Hello. We got a good group today. We're in different places, but <laughs> yes, yes. It looks like That's Jim is was fantastic. Thank you all for being a part of it. It was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like Jim is moving a little better. Our services lately have just been fantastic. Just real spiritually high for me. Mm -hmm. What is for the story too. about the, what is the story about the blind men and the donkey? Uh the blind men and the donkey. Well, uh, I think it probably has something to do with the uh, getting kicked, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. They get a kick out of life. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wayne had a few words to say about a month, month and a half ago about talking, listening to it, listening to a donkey say something. Oh yes, <laughs> I don't <even> remember that. <laughs> talking about the guy listening to the donkey for the answers. Remember the donkey? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim, it looks like you're moving a little bit better today. Than you were the oh, last no. time. Are you? Yeah, I. It, I guess in a way, I. It might be a little bit better, but uh, yeah, it's not. It just seemed like you were able to get up and down much easier than the last time that you were up front. Yeah, that that part was probably better. Yeah. Going from point A to point B. Boy, that's uh, that, it's, that's kind of rough. It's it's not it's not an ascending line yet. No, not yet. <clears throat> Y'all have a great week. You, you too. too. You too. So you. Good to see you all. I'm gonna. Good, good to see, see you all. all. I'm gonna sign off and see you next week. All right. All right, Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Patrick. Always good to see you. Take care, everybody. Is uh, Patty? You all have a good week. Thanks. You too. Pat Patty, is your gym still having physical therapy then? She, she just signed off, Mom. Oh, okay. <laughs>